Hello and welcome to the Unchained Capital Vaults Continuing Education webinar series. Uh, today we're going to be discussing replacing hardware wallets and restoring seed phrases. So I'm going to be uh, leading this today. I'll be your host. I'm David Layton, the Director of Concierge Services, uh, joined by Tyler Campbell, our Technical Director of Concierge, and Justine Harper, our VP of Concierge. So if you have not joined us with these webinars before, I just want to touch on, um, we do these every, every month, the first Friday, and these are exclusive for our clients. We do post these uh, about a week after we record them to YouTube, so you can go back to reference or share them. But uh, this webinar right now is live, so you can ask questions as we go, and it's also exclusive for Unchained Capital clients. Uh, the agenda for today with the replacing hardware wallets and restoring seed phrases, we're going to start with key terms. Uh, I will be leading us in key terms and going through some of the topics that we're going to discuss today. And then we're going to uh, hand it over to Justine to do a high level seed phrase overview. Uh, next, we'll jump into replacing hardware wallets uh, from different manufacturers. So we have a couple of demos set up for you guys today. And we'll be, of course, discussing the Ledger and Trezor and Cold Card, the three devices that uh, we currently use with our platform. Uh, after that, we're going to go into restoring seed phrases on existing hardware. So that's if one of your devices wipes, uh, what do you do? Uh, how do you recover the private keys? Uh, and then, uh, as always, we're going to wrap this up with a Q&A. So feel free to drop questions into the, the Q&A or the chat box as we go or you can build them up, save them to the end and try and stump us with some recovery uh, hardware wallet questions as we, as we wrap up today. So, perfect. Um, let's jump into the key terms here. Uh, we're going to start with a, a term that everybody's probably familiar with, maybe not how it works, uh, but that is Bitcoin address. So Bitcoin address is where your Bitcoin lives. So Bitcoin lives on the blockchain in an address. Uh, we have two examples here, one of a single signature address, um, which is built using one public key. And we have an example of a multi-signature address, which is an address that is built using two or more public keys. Um, they look pretty similar uh, to, another, to the untrained eye. They look virtually identical. Uh, there's a couple of differences. But what will uh, describe these, or the next thing to describe a Bitcoin address, um, is that it is, oh, sorry, Tyler, if you wanted to jump back to that, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things there. So um, they're, they're built from one or many public keys and the entire world can see the balances of every Bitcoin address uh, on the blockchain. And that's how we verify the supply cap of 21 million. So public ledger, that's what Bitcoin blockchain is. Um, that's why it's so powerful. And uh, every Bitcoin that exists lives in an address. So we can jump into the next one here. Okay, term number two, public key. Um, you can think of this as a lock to a given address. So uh, public keys or public data uh, is generated from a private key and uh, a public key is used to construct a single address. Um, you can think of public addresses, or I'm sorry, public keys being um, what you need to build an address and then public keys, of course, are um, derived from private keys. So that's going to be the next topic that we jump into here, or the next key term. So if you think of public keys are used to build addresses and receive Bitcoin, private keys um, are used to spend or withdraw Bitcoin from an address. So public keys receive, private keys spend. Um, you can also think of it as a single key to an address and the hardware wallets or the devices that we're going to be working with today, they know how to use the private key information to sign a transaction to spend the Bitcoin. And another note there, um, every private key has a corresponding uh, individual public key. Um, you can actually generate an almost unlimited amount of public keys from a single private key. And we'll get a little more into that as we go. All right, so the next term here you may have heard um, it just on, on Twitter, on YouTube, certain places is XPUB. So what is an XPUB? It's an extended public key. That's what the XPUB uh, stands for. Um, you can think of this as a master lock. Uh, you can also derive an almost infinite, infinite uh, number of public keys from an extended public key. And that's why you can also think of it as a, a master public key. Um, the public key is shared with wallet software to build a series of addresses or your wallet. 
Um, and then a, a C phrase can derive, um, C phrase or private key can derive nearly infinite amount of X pubs or extended public keys. So we'll touch on that a little bit more as we go as well. All right, so the last term here is um, the spotlight term of the day, which is seed phrases. Um, you can think of this as a master key. Uh, a seed phrase is the most important piece of information for you to protect. So the seed phrase has a, a lot of different uh, way, there's a lot of different terminologies that actually mean seed phrase. So if you say recovery seed or recovery phrase, uh, mnemonic code, uh, backup seed, recovery phrase, BIP39 seed phrase, all of those are interchangeable and they all mean seed phrase. So for the sake of um, this webinar and trying to stay consistent, we'll go ahead and use either recovery or seed phrase uh, when we're talking about the seed. So it's very important important to note that the seed phrase is the most important thing to secure. Um, you can use it to restore your private key. Um, anybody who has access to the seed phrase has access to being able to recover your private key, which is used to spend Bitcoin. And you always, always want to keep a physical copy of it. So this is what a 24 word seed phrase looks like down there. Um, very bold of us to show it on the screen here, but uh, I can assure you that it is not protecting uh, any Bitcoin. So if you try to recover this, uh, unfortunately you won't be able to get any of Tyler's Bitcoin. All right, so we'll move on to the next here. And this is the, so this is the last key term, wallet configuration file. So a wallet configuration file um, has a lot of information in it. Uh, you can see a, a, a snapshot of what that looks like at the bottom there. It has um, the key information, uh, your derivation paths, your uh, public keys. So all th with a multi-sig wallet, uh, all three extended public keys that were used to build that wallet. And then the address type, which is pay to script hash with unchained and uh, the quorum, which is two of three. So you need all of this data in order to restore your multi-signature wallet, um, either outside of unchained, if you weren't able to access unchained for any reason, um, or just to restore it in general. So we can think of this as directions to your multi-sig address um, or your multi-sig wallet, and you can use it to find your multi-signature address if the wallet software that you used uh, initially to create it is unavailable. Um, and then, of course, it has all of the, the XPubs. So I kind of described that at the beginning, but this, it, it's, it's very important to know that if you build a multi-signature wallet, you want to have a wallet configuration file um, saved to cloud storage uh, behind some layer of encryption so you can access it from multiple devices. And I say that um, it's important because the, the most important thing that we do at Unchained is teach people how to take custody of their Bitcoin and remove every single point of failure. So having your wallet configuration file, your backup file, is a way to remove unchained as a single point of failure um, and store, storing it behind some layer of encryption in cloud storage is a way to remove a single device or a hard drive encrypted or otherwise as a single point of failure. So this is a very important file as well. All right. So now um, that was the introduction and review of the key terms as we always start with. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Justine and she's going to talk high level about uh, seed phrases with her seed phrase overview. Awesome, thank you, David. Um, yes, yeah, so seed phrases. Seed phrases are kind of magical and, and David did a really great job of explaining a lot of different aspects of them, but I wanted to touch on it sort of some things that maybe individuals watching don't know about seed phrases and some fun facts. So where do seed phrases come from? What are they and how are they created? So essentially a seed phrase is a code or algorithm that represents your long secret number that is your Bitcoin private key. Each word represents or encodes a range of bits in that number. And it's pulled from a library of 2048 words known as the bit 39 library that you can look up yourself. These lists are cross compatible uh, with different wallets, which we'll talk about in just a little bit and completely separate from the devices and wallet. So that's really important to remember that when you're thinking of your key, this is your key. The device is the user interface that you're using to interact with it. These devices are great and they're secure, but they can malfunction. You can do a firmware update, those words can be wiped. So this is why it's super important to have physical copies of your seed phrases themselves, because you can just import those back into the devices, which again, we're gonna show you step-by-step step how to do. 
Um, but fun facts with seed phrases. So of course, these are called a lot of different things, which David touched on a lot of, uh, a little bit earlier, but essentially sometimes you can hear them referred to as backups, recovery phrases, or seed phrases in general, and a lot of others. But those are the same thing. This is just the master key to your Bitcoin custody in the form of a 12 to 24 list of words. Um, so other fun facts, many wallet softwares automatically generate these for you, but you can do it yourself with some dice and entropy. Um, word list is designed in a way that only the first four letters are used, or first four letters, I'm sorry, of each word are needed to actually do a recovery by looking at the list specifically. Like we said, devices can fail, damaged, lost, or upgraded, and this word list can be used to simply recover that key on any device. Um, we're going to walk into that a little bit more, but I do recommend dropping any questions that you have, digging into that BIP39 information that you can find on GitHub along uh, with anywhere on the internet. And we also had a really great seed phrase uh, um, blog come out recently that you can find on the Unchained uh, interface that actually I will link to you here, but I would definitely recommend looking into them. Really great and important to know that the seed phrases are separate from the device. Keep that in mind. Seed phrase is your key. This is your backup. It's the backup to the information that your device is holding. All right. So let's go back over to David, who's going to walk us through our first demonstration of how we move from one device to another. David? Awesome. All right, Justine, thank you for that overview. Uh, as, as Justine pointed to, it is the very most important piece of information to protect. So we're going to kind of lean into that and talk about the seeds uh, quite a bit during this webinar. But the next thing we're going to show you um, is how to replace hardware wallets uh, from one manufacturer, I, I guess from if you generated a key and backed it up using one hardware wallet from a manufacturer in this case, it's going to be Ledger. How do you restore that key to another device uh, like a Trezor? So what we have done um, for this webinar is we generated a private key using this, <clears throat> this Ledger, and then we backed it up uh, right here. And again, these are 24 words that aren't securing any Bitcoin. So if you have a good eye, nice try. Um, and, and we're going to take this seed phrase and we're going to use it to restore the same private key to a uh, Trezor. So the first thing that you'll need to do is get on to Trezor Suite. And this is the, what the welcome screen looks like. If you do not see your Trezor, if you have it plugged in and your computer's not recognizing it, you'll need to hit the drop down next to still don't see your Trezor and install a little piece of software called the Trezor Bridge. So there's just a little insider pro tip for you if you run into any issues uh, while recovering. So the next screen here will ask you, are you trying to create a new wallet or generate a new private key? Or would you like to restore from a backup? So the option that we're going to do here is recover wallet. That's the option on the right. And it'll lead you to this page where it asks, are you sure you'd like to start the recovery? So you click start recovery, and then it brings you to um, this pre-recorded video. We wanted to show you uh, quickly how our recovery is done. So typically this takes about six to seven minutes. So um, I'm going to walk you through the steps pretty quickly. Uh, first, you select your, no your number of words. So it's going to be either 12 or 24 with the devices we use. And then you click continue and you just start entering in the words. So I start with Jaguar and this is a touchscreen device. So I go J-A-G. As soon as you hit three or four letters, it'll autofill the rest of the word from that 2048 word list, and then you click enter um, and just go through the entire process, uh, word one through 24, uh, until all 24 words are plugged into this device. And it is very important to know that <clears throat> these words are, when you write them down, uh, it's not case sensitive. So you can see how I wrote in all caps, but um, the, the, the order of them are incredibly important. So as you can see, all 24 words have been entered, and now I go to set a pin. So confirm on the device that you really want to set a pin or make the device pin protected. So that's what I'm doing there. And then go ahead and enter the very secure 2121. Obviously, that's a nod to Bitcoin's 21 million uh, market cap, or not market cap, <laughs> uh, supply cap. And then just like that, you have successfully enabled the pin and you have restored a private key on a device that was not originally used to generate that private key. So 
Very important to know. You could also do it with a ledger, a cold card, a Trezor, any device. All right, so we'll pop over to the next slide here. And this is the screen that you will see if you did it successfully, recovery completed. Okay. So beautiful. Um, the next thing that we're going to jump into here is uh, Tyler's going to take over and show you what a Trezor or Ledger recovery looks like on a cold card. So it's slightly different from just going from one Ledger to a Trezor. Cold cards um, are, are typically for a little more technical users. Um, there's always a, a little bit of a difference, something that you need to program it to understand or just something different with the cold cards. And that's kind of what we will, we will touch on here. So if you'd like to go ahead and begin, Tyler. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, I do have my cold card mug too, because this is the section that I get to cover. So I'm like fully uh, in, in matching theme here. Um, when we're talking about cold cards, um, really the thing to note with cold card devices is that they are air gapped meaning we don't plug them into the computer um, but you know they do offer you the ability to import an like an existing wallet maybe a 24 or 12 word seed somewhere else coming from a ledger or a treasure device you can import that existing seed into your cold card so if you're using a cold card and you'd like to wipe it completely um, the steps that you would use to do that are in the advanced menu and within advanced, there's a danger zone area. Uh, from that danger zone area, you could select seed functions and wipe your device. That is for like wiping a device that's already in use. Um, but let's say you have a ledger and you want to import your ledger seed uh, into a brand new cold card. Well, after you plug in your cold card and configure your pin, you're gonna see this screen uh, on the far left here, which is uh, has new wallet at the top. Uh, and then underneath that, it says import existing. And that's what you'd select. So you'd press the check mark for import existing. And then on that middle screen, similar to how David showed with the Trezor, you're able to select the number of words uh, that your importing seed contains. So we have 24, 18, 12. Now, once you make your selection there on the far right side, you'd be able to enter word one uh, all the way through 12 or 24. And you do it uh, kind of in a similar fashion, although it is just a little bit more time consuming. You select the first letter. Um, and as Justine mentioned earlier, actually, you only need the first four letters of the seed. So if my uh, word was gallery, for example, I would need G-A-L-L. -L. That's why I have G selected there. And as soon as I have G-A-L-L -L entered, it would pop up with gallery and press the check mark. And that's my word number one. You do that all the way through your 24 or 12 words. And you now have your uh, cold card with the seed that came from your treasure or your ledger. Now, there's a few things to note about recovering onto a cold card when you're dealing with multi-sig and when you're dealing with unchained vaults. So the first one here is in order to sign, you must configure your cold card. Uh, what we mean by this is that you need to import your cold card configuration file. So your treasure and your ledger, they pl we plug them into the computer. We can say they get their multi-sig brains from the computer. With the cold card, it's a little bit different because it's air gapped. So we need to effectively take it to multi-sig school. And we do that by importing a wallet configuration file into the cold card itself. So if you do recover a ledger seed or a treasure seed into a cold card, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you go back and take your cold card to multi-sig school and import that configuration file so it can be used. Now, the second step here is, or the second thing to note rather, is that a seed phrase recovered onto a cold card will not be able to successfully perform a key check. Uh, it will be able to sign a partially signed Bitcoin transaction because it is your key, uh, but it will not be able to successfully perform a key check. And that has to do with some derivation path differences between the ledger and treasure devices and the cold card device. So if you do try to do a key check with your newly restored cold card, you're going to see that error message that I've included down here on bottom in red. Um, so, you know, most important point being you can sign, you're just not going to be able to do a key check. So the last bullet point kind of ties into that red error message. Um, you can add your newly restored key, uh, your newly restored seed on your cold card as a new key and use it to create a new vault and move your funds over to that new vault if you'd like to perform key checks with your cold card device. Um, I would recommend doing that. Doing key checks every 90 days, again, is a really, really strong best practice just so you know that your device can work when you need it most. Um, so if you are recovering a treasure or a ledger seed onto a cold card, these are just a few things to be mindful of. 
So the next step here after talking about, you know, that cold card and kind of the nuances there with cold card, what we want to cover is restoring seed phrases onto existing hardware. So uh, before we kind of dive into that, I want to make sure to pause when the, and, you know, for your cold card users out there. Um, are there any questions that came through at this time? I know <clears throat> we have a Q&A box with some awesome questions coming in through our webinars in the past. So uh, are there any that, that piqued your interest, Justine? We have a ton of really great questions. Most awesome. are um, in regard to C phrases. So since we're doing really well on time, I might grab a couple here. Um, let's see, the first one that I saw about seed phrases specifically was essentially from Scott, which I think was just a misunderstanding of what we said, so just wanted to clarify. Um, Scott said, when you say the seed is different from what's on the device, does that mean that there is some translation hash between the seed and the private key? No, what's on the device is your seed phrase. It's the, your private key. The seed phrase is an algorithm representing that in a word form. So what your device is holding is that key. So it is the same. It is storing other additional information, but it's all that's tied to the seed phrase itself. So I just wanted to clarify that for Scott specifically. Um, there were a couple other questions about seed phrases. One was about the 24 uh, word recovery is understood. He knows how to recover that into a device, but how do you recover the 25th word or passphrase to restore the private key? So passphrases, I don't know if Tyler, you wanna take this, maybe explain how a passphrase can't really be um, recovered in that way. Explain maybe the difference, what a passphrase is and mm -hmm. pros and cons, if you don't mind kind of jumping into that a little bit for clarity. Of course, yeah. So just to kind of at a, at a high level view, talking about a passphrase, uh, really what a passphrase is, you can think about it under the framework of a 25th word or a 13th word. Um, it is an extension of your seed phrase that fundamentally changes your seed. So it's different from a pin in that respect. Your devices have unique pins. But those pins are device specific. A passphrase actually alters your seed. So different devices handle the activation of, of passphrases a little bit differently. Um, if you know your 24 or 12 word seed and you recover that onto a device, uh, for the Trezor, for example, you'd be able to go into the Trezor suite and turn on passphrases and access your passphrase key. Now, with cold cards, uh, there is an option on the main menu underneath ready to sign. Uh, you can scroll down just a little bit and activate a passphrase on a cold card. So recovering, we want to recover that, that 12 or 24 word seed under the device first, and then treat the passphrase as something that you can activate um, a little bit later on. Now, the trade-offs in doing so, um, you know, passphrases are a really interesting way to add a little bit of security to your setup. And, you know, it might be common in, in instances where folks use just one hardware device and one seed phrase to secure their Bitcoin, uh, because then they could have, you know, an additional passphrase and make it a little bit more complicated for somebody to compromise their funds. But when we're dealing with multi-sig, we already have additive security and additive redundancy. So when we think about multi-sig, especially two of three and the service we provide, you know, you have four things that you need to protect, uh, your two devices and your two sets of seed phrases. You know, a lot could go wrong uh, and you'd still be able to access your funds. You could lose two of your devices and one of your seed phrases. And as long as you have that remaining seed phrase, we are your collaborative custody partner and hold the other key, you'd be able to access your funds. When you throw a passphrase into the mix, that just becomes yet another single point of failure and another thing that you need to keep track of. So it is a general recommendation to, you know, if you're using two of three multi-sig, you already are, you know, in our opinion, uh, using the most secure way to store your Bitcoin. So using a passphrase, I would really, really think hard about it and just, you know, note with yourself the trade-offs there and the potential for the single point of failure. Yes, thank you. Um, I will I've got one more question I think is relevant here and then we can move on to the next section. You guys are asking amazing questions and we will go through all of this. We're going to have a whole Q&A section at the end. So I'm just trying to pinpoint ones that are sort of specific to what we've discussed so far. Um, so Jim had a really great question about if you fear that your seed phrases might have been compromised, can you reset the device, restore it with a new seed and then use it in your multi-sig? So I can answer this one really quickly. Yes, you can totally wipe the device. You can create a new seed on that device, write that down, and then you can do a replacement in your multi-sig vault with Unchained Capital. You just replace the keys specifically. You could create a whole new vault. We do have a key replacement in there. So just wanted to touch on that specifically. And then I know we were going to jump right into how to rest restore seed phrases on the same type of device. Maybe it's the one that you have existing or the same model. So I will turn that back over to Tyler for that. And then we will do more questions in just a few guys. 
Perfect. So uh, what we're talking about here is restoring seed phrases onto a Trezor. So let's say you have a Trezor and you really like it and you work with it all the time, but something might happen to it and you need to recover your existing seed phrase uh, on your existing device. So a couple of situations where that might occur is, hey, you know, as Justine mentioned early on, uh, you know, these devices aren't perfect. And so if your device unintentionally wipes during a firmware update, um, that might be an instance where it's like, okay, now I have my device, but it's not loaded up with my seed phrase. What do I do? Uh, the second instance is a forgotten pin. So pins are device specific. And I mean, the world we live in now, we have passwords for everything, pins for everything. You know, if you forget your pin, then, sh you know, you should be able to reset your Trezor device. And that's where you still have your existing device, but you just need to wipe it and add your or seed phrase once more. So a forgotten pin could cause the device to become inaccessible. Uh, the last one is if your device is damaged or malfunctioning, but you want to just replace it with the same model device. So... In order to do this for the Trezor, and I'm going to show screenshots here or pictures rather of the Trezor Model T, and I'll be able to note, you know, the slight differences with the Trezor Model 1 as well. So in the case of a device unintentionally wiping during a firmware update, uh, the Trezor Suite is going to look the same as it is when you set it up as a brand new device uh, when you plug it in. So if your device wipes during a firmware update, you go to plug it in. The Trezor suite shows you this setup right here. It just says set up Trezor. Uh, when you're expecting fully just to be logged into the Trezor suite, that's when you know you can click set up Trezor. Uh, you're gonna see that screen there on the right-hand side. You can select recover wallet and work through that same workflow that David uh, showed in his video just a short while ago. So if your device unintentionally wipes, the Trezor suite does have this you know, handy recovery flow for you. Now, in the case where you have a forgotten pin, uh, you do need to load up your Trezor device in what's called bootloader mode. So bootloader mode allows you to essentially bypass the pin in order to wipe the device. So with bootloader mode for the Trezor Model T, what you're gonna wanna do is plug your device in while rubbing your finger on the screen of the device. It's a little bit of a weird workflow, um, but the screen then will appear in your Trezor as shown there. So it's gonna say bootloader, uh, the firmware version by Satoshi Labs, and it's going to ask, ask you to connect to host, and you can press the little check mark there. So that's what the bootloader screen looks like on the Trezor Model T. For the Model 1, in order to upload or to, to plug that device in and load it up into bootloader mode, you're going to want to plug it in while holding down the two buttons on the device. Um, and then it is going to display on the screen that it is in bootloader mode. So you want to make sure to have those two buttons held down. Once you are loaded up into bootloader mode, what you can do is access uh, wallet.trezor.io uh, from a compatible browser with Trezor uh, to proceed to resetting your device. So I have a screenshot here for you. I've noted in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, wallet.trezor.io, and then down on bottom, the, we have the factory reset uh, button where you're able to you know, reset your device. You're gonna be asked to confirm one time on your device, and then your device is gonna be wiped. Once your device is wiped, really it's just going back it's going to be the same screens that you see here in the Trezor suite once you've completely wiped your device. You're going to be able to set up your Trezor just like setting up an entirely new device, and you'd be able to select Recover Wallet. So this is that like you know that extra confirmation screen uh, before you do uh, wipe the device. Just want to make note you will be asked uh, by Trezor, you know, do you really want to wipe your device? Your seed will be erased. Um, and if you are confident that you do have, again, your seed physically secure, this cannot be uh, overstated. We do want to have make sure when and you're, whenever you're wiping your device, uh, you know, intentionally, right? If you forgot your pin, uh, you do want to make sure, again, you have your seed physically secure. Awesome. So now uh, we are at the Q&A portion. And as evidenced uh, just a short while ago, we have some awesome questions coming through. So I will hand it over to, uh, to Justine to see which questions we can start tackling first. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. And I, uh, I know we, we just threw a lot of information at everybody. So we have a lot of really good questions. I know we had some frequently asked questions that come up often. Um, David, did you want to go through those real quick while I sort of organize which questions we're going to do first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, thank you, Tyler. Um, that was, I think, going through the replacing the wallets uh, or just replacing, restoring, and then what happens if you're uh, seed gets wiped, uh, device gets wiped during a firmware update is incredibly important. They're all pretty similar, but there's enough nuance and difference between them that it's it's great to touch on all of them. 
So thank you. Uh, the next section, as Justine said, uh, we're going to go into the Q&A, but we did have a frequently asked question that comes up on most of the webinars that we touch on this type of topic, and it's, uh, do I need to replace my key within my Unchained Vault if I replace my hardware wallet or my hardware device? Uh, no, you do not. So as so long as you have, again, from the demo, say you generated a private key here, you backed it up, here's your seed phrase. So long as you have this piece of information, you can use it to restore your seed, restore your key to a uh, Trezor device, cold card, another ledger. Um, you do not need to do anything within your vault. You will then be able to apply signatures um, using that same key uh, with a new device. So you can always, as Justine said, replace, uh, do, a, do a key replacement. You can also upload as many keys as you would like to Unchained. There's not a limit to that as well as creating as many vaults as you would like. So it's important to touch on that also. Uh, let's go ahead and I think that's that's the one I wanted to cover. Let's go ahead and pop back over to Justine. Um, if you have a Q&A uh, from the chat, I see we have quite a few. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We there. do. Yeah, we have some really good ones and I've been trying to organize them along the way. So yeah, I just want to kind of kind of wrap it up a little bit of what we've just seen. So essentially we've gone over how your seed phrases are completely separate from the device itself and how you can change those devices and keep the same key and how you don't have to change that within your Unchained Capital Vault because it is the same key. You're just using a different user interface to interact with it. Of course, the cold card being a little bit different there, which Tyler went over. So I hope that was really helpful. And we do have some really good questions about these things that we covered as well as some just general questions about Unchained Capital as well. So I'm going to work through them just sort of in the order that they came in for a bit. So from John, he asked, if I have an IRA account with Unchained Capital, along with a regular personal account, can I use the same wallets on multiple accounts, aka, I believe, keys and devices? David, do you want to go over how an individual can use the same devices and keys on multiple accounts within their Unchained Capital? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think Tyler touched on it briefly, um, derivation paths. So um, you can use the same private key to generate an almost unlimited amount of public keys uh, or XPUBs. And that is, it's okay to use the same private key um, to use a specific derivation path to produce a extended public key in your personal account. And you can use the same private key to use a different derivation path to produce a completely unique, completely different extended public key for your business account or IRA account. account. So um, those addresses don't even know each other uh, exists. They're using the same private key, different public keys, create di completely different addresses. Um, so yes, you can use the same devices. Uh, you can use the same private keys for both business and personal. Um, you just need to do one, what we call a, an advanced setting or an advanced feature. And that's just tweaking the, the derivation paths or the pathway um, where private goes to public. Awesome. Thank you for that. All right. So next question from Conrad. In a multi-sig setup, do I need to regularly get all my di devices together to check if all the devices are working? Tyler, do you want to talk about that a little bit? You touched on it, but can you dig a little mm -hmm. bit deeper into what that involves and what are the best practices there? Yeah, of course. Of course. So that's a fantastic question. Um, when we think about making sure your devices are working, that's why we have the in-platform uh, feature called a key check. So you can think about the key check as like a, you know, a, a health check on your devices just to make sure they are working and operational. Uh, the underlying thesis here is that you don't want uh, two years to go by and then you do need to move Bitcoin and you need to provide a signature. You go to plug in your device and the screen's not working. And it's like, okay, well, when did that happen? You know, we want to stay on top of that as, as best we can. So in the platform, we have this 90 day cadence set for our key checks. So as you add your keys, uh, you're going to see, you know, 89 days since last key check or 12 days since last key check. Um, and that is kind of that counter to that 90 day threshold where you know that's when we want you to log into the platform and connect your keys. So to answer your question uh, you know that, that, that you just brought up, it's 
you know, you might be adding your keys at a different date. So their time until that 90 day limit might be a little bit different, um, but you do not have to have them both together, both devices together in order to do a key check. You could key check one, you know, wait a week and key check the other one. So you don't ever have to co-locate your devices. Um, it is kind of helpful if you just happen to have them both with you and you can do a key check. Um, so it's really up to you, but you do not have to have them both co-located co together. Um, when we think about what a key check is fundamentally doing, it's sharing that extended public key with Unchained Capital. Uh, your device, you know, connecting to Unchained in the case of a Trezor or a Ledger to share that extended public key just helps you know that your device is working. It also helps you kind of remember which device you're working with. If you have two Trezor Model Ts and they look really similar, it's easy to separate them or confuse them if you haven't you know, added a label maker or something uh, to put the name of the key on the device. So doing a key check is just a really nice way for you to stay up to date, confident and plugging in and working with your key, uh, entering your pin, you know, that's something that could be you know, maybe forgotten over time if it's not written down. So it's a good best practice to, to do those key checks at that 90 day cadence. Um, with your cold card, it's exporting a public key file to your micro SD card. And you, know, you wanna be in the, in the mindset of wanting to do that every now and then just so you know that your cold card can write things to that micro sd card because ultimately that's how it signs transactions so really it's just making sure that your device is accessible usable uh, especially when you need it most perfect thank you for that i just want to add on um yes goal is for you not to bring your keys to the same location ever right so the site is actually designed for you not to have to do that so you don't have to do those key checks at the same time even if it's alerting you hey you've got this key check due it's totally okay to wait till you're at that second location for your second key. Um, I say that because there's a follow-up question from John asking, can you talk about what happens if you don't key check with Unchained Capital after 90 days? What happens to the keys if I want to access my vault after? That's a great question. Um, essentially, what's going to happen is on, you're going to get a lot of emails, right? And then on the these emails, it's going to tell you that this key is going to be um, essentially turned off, right? Um, and all that means is it's going to sit there until you actually plug it in and activate it again. So nothing occurs to your Bitcoin, nothing changes from your Bitcoin custody standpoint, you still hold the keys. So it's really best to wait until you go to those separate locations and just do a key check rather than trying to rush, make mistakes, have things in multiple locations or the same location and so forth. Um, so from unchained standpoint, nothing really changes from a custody standpoint. Um, we just are simply going to disengage that key until you plug it back in and use it again or do a key check. Um, so I hope that answered that question specifically there. There are a few more here that, let's see here. So from um, Jeff and David, maybe you could touch on this a little bit. He's asking if we know the failure rate of these devices. I don't think we know the failure rate, but we can maybe talk about a little bit that these devices aren't perfect. And that's why seed phrases are important. And maybe, you know, how many times do we see a client that has a firmware update that wipes the device? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, it's hardware. So we operate under the assumption that it will probably break at some point in the future. That's why uh, we can't stress the importance of having that physical uh, seed phrase backed up. Um, it's very important. But the failure rate, um, I don't know. I, I think between the three of us, we have over combined a decade experience working with hardware devices. Um, I have never had a device fail. Um, I tinker with them quite a bit. And I think all of them from my, my very first uh, uh, ledger uh, years ago are, are still operational. Um, having said that, I have heard stories about people who have not backed up their seed phrase, um, just had the device itself with the key on it and something happened, it was wiped, it was broken, screen stopped working. Um, and that's obviously a situation you would never wanna be in. So I don't know if uh, Tyler or Justine, if you guys have seen a device fail. Um, I think my only experience is where touchscreen, uh, one of the corners didn't work while I was on a call with a client. We ended up replacing it. So plan for the worst that it will break, but expect that uh, these devices will last for a little while. Yeah, I think you touched on it. Great. I think the importance here is just you don't want to have to trust this device, right? That's not what they're designed for. They're designed for them to secure your keys offline, and they do that very well. Um, but yes, sometimes they malfunction. Sometimes they may break. Sometimes you may get an error. And that's why having your physical seed phrases is vital. And that's why Unchained Capital recommends that specifically. So yeah, very a great question comes up all the time. I think it's really important to note that. 
Um, there was a I little will, bit of a follow-up question about that. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add there, like when you think about that, think about the other hardware in your devices or in your in your lives as well, right? Uh, how often is it that a cell phone is is perfect for a long amount of time or a USB drive or something like that? You know, these devices are are built, um, you know, to do specific tasks and they're built very well. Um, but just to emphasize and drive that point home that they are at the end of the day hardware and they are fallible. So just uh, just worth noting that there. Yeah, I think that's really vital. I mean, they're really good devices, but like Phil always likes to mention, right? These are like second generation devices. They will improve over time. The mm -hmm. important thing here is that you're securing your, your key, your master key for sure. Great questions today. I'm, I'm like blown away by these questions, guys. You're doing so good. Um, I see you're doing so good. These are just really good questions. So uh, let's jump into the next one from Jacob. Is it possible to restore an Unchained Capital multi-sig uh, wallet on another platform other than Caravan? For example, Spectre Desktop. This is a great question. We actually did a webinar about this not too long ago, Tyler. So if you want to actually maybe jump in, do a quick overview of how that works, and then I can actually go and grab the webinar to share. Awesome. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, fantastic question. Um, and again, that is that power of you know, using that wallet configuration file. And like David mentioned in the, in the key terms, you know, not having Unchained Capital as a single point of failure, right? You'd be able to recover your multi-sig vault uh, in another Bitcoin wallet coordinator software, right? That's what they're referred to. Um, the webinar that Justine's going to grab in that webinar, we, we rebuilt a multi-sig vault, not only in Caravan, but also over in Sparrow wallet, um, as well as Electro. So those are really popular choices. Uh, Sparrow Wallet uh, recently came out with version 1.5 and they're, they're beyond that now. Uh, but what you'd be able to do with Sparrow Wallet, it's really just a, a six click uh, recovery. You just import that wallet configuration file and Sparrow instantly reads, uh, just much like Caravan does, your extended public keys, those paths, uh, and even your, your key names. So it's really, really slick. Electrum, a little bit more complicated. You do have to manually copy and paste your public keys and your derivation paths. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, you can rebuild your vault in Caravan, Sparrow, and Electrum. I know the question was specifically targeted at Spectre. Um, right now, at least to my knowledge and my own testing, uh, the wallet descriptors for P2SH uh, multi-sig quorums uh, are not supported by Spectre at the moment. So that is one limitation uh, of rebuilding your multi-sig vault over in Spectre. But as you know, uh, Justine was just mentioning about these devices improving. Also, we have incredible talent in the Bitcoin space and open source wallet platforms are improving. Uh, Craig Raw behind Sparrow is, is an amazing, you know, just he's shipping code constantly. The team at Spectre is doing the exact same thing. So I would expect, you know, in due time in the future, uh, the greater compatibility between all of these wallets and the standards associated with them is going to be in increased over time. I do encourage you to check out that webinar that we did, though. I think that would cover a lot of information. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I did drop that into the chat. Um, but if you're listening to this after, you can access all of the webinars on this YouTube channel. Uh, we usually release them about a week after the live recording. And so you can see all of these past webinars there for you to reference back to. So this is sort of similar question or follow up that maybe David, you could handle here. Um, Jerry asks, is there a way to find or recover a wallet configuration file. So can you maybe discuss with Unchained Capital clients where they can find that, how that works, and maybe some best practices for storing to ensure they have that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with Unchained Capital specifically, um, you would download your wallet configuration file as a JSON file, it's a type of text file, um, directly from your vault. So we have it in a very odd location. It's above the trend or the transfer tile. Um, there's three vertical dots that you would click on and it shows external spend information. You click that and it shows the wallet configuration file that we had an image of during the key terms. So that's, um, and what Tyler just covered as well. That's your keys, derivation paths, XPUBs, address type form. Um, so you find it there uh, in your dashboard each this is actually important to touch on. If you create a second vault or a third vault, each vault will have its own unique wallet configuration file. So as you create new vaults for organizational purposes, um, you're going to want to download its own unique wallet config file um, from, from the vault. And then again, store it in uh, encrypted cloud storage so you can access it from multiple devices. 
And Perfect. I think, thank uh, you. you know, and there was, from, oh, sorry, just for the uh, delay. Just no, to, uh, jump in, Tyler, please. So I think a really awesome piece of content that came out from our team recently was going over that wallet configuration file and the elements within it. Um, I think that is a fantastic, fantastic run through of the wallet configuration file. So to familiarize yourself with that as well, I would suggest uh, checking out our blog and checking out that piece of content as well. Um, we'll work with our team to make sure that's noted in the description uh, for this webinar on YouTube, if we can get that your way as well. Um, so just wanted to, to pump up that piece of content because I think it is fantastic. Love it. I was actually grabbing it. So I'm actually pasting it in the chat right now for anybody interested. And then there was a follow-up question that's, I say follow-up, but just kind of talking about the same topic here. So Barry was asking, um, does access to that XPUB information alone give anyone access to my Bitcoin? Or is the seed phrase, aka key, needed um, as well? David, do you want to jump in and answer that? Yeah, so I, I, that's a great question. And it gets asked a lot, like what information can be used to move Bitcoin? Um, with a traditional single SIG, you need the seed or the private key information in order to sign a transaction to move Bitcoin. So in a single SIG, which is not what Unchained does, you would just need one of these recovery seed phrases to access someone's Bitcoin. Um, with multi-sig, <clears throat> you need at least two of three of the private keys or private key information seed in order to move Bitcoin. So having somebody's public key information um, means that you could have visibility over addresses associated with those public keys and address balances. Uh, the wallet configuration file is a good example. If you have access to someone's wallet configuration file, you have access to um, or visibility on the amount of Bitcoin that they have within that multi-signature wallet. You cannot move Bitcoin from that wallet. You cannot withdraw without applying multiple signatures from the private keys. So think again, the public keys used to uh, receive Bitcoin, private keys used to spend Bitcoin. Awesome, thank you for that. So yeah, it shares information, but they cannot access your Bitcoin with that information. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Barry, for that question. So we've got a couple more here and we're doing really good on time so we can take our time in answering these here. Yeah. So one question that I see from John is asking about a cold card. Is a cold card necessary? It seems like a treasure would be fine. Not sure why we need a cold card. Is it too much hassle? I know we're all fans of cold card, but we can probably kind of relate as a newcomer, they're a little terrifying. Um, so Tyler, if you can maybe jump in, talk about the pros of cold card and then maybe, you know, like how, when is it okay to maybe stick with Trezor? I know it's personal preference, but maybe you could kind of jump in a little bit and give your opinion on that. For sure, no, absolutely. Um, so when working with cold cards and, and you're absolutely right, is that they're a little bit more uh, complicated. There's a little bit more legwork involved in setting up that cold card. So the section I covered, you know, taking your cold card to multi-sig school, uh, we need to transfer a lot of data using a micro SD card back and forth. So it is a little bit more involved uh, from that perspective. So some of the pros of cold card, um, you know, not being or not having to plug it into a computer. So keeping it, it air gapped is kind of nice. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to, you know, just from a general security feeling, you don't have to plug it into an internet connected device, uh, especially for something that's, you know, generating your seed words. Um, so that is a nice pro. Uh, the CoinKite team, the team behind Cold Card and the Block Clock, the infamous Block Clock that um, you may or may not be aware of, along with some other awesome uh, kind of hardware related devices coming from CoinKite, the team is really, really strong. Uh, you know, they're, they're, awesome, uh, an awesome company to work with in the Bitcoin space, and they built up a great reputation. Uh, so cold card, you know, the device is built incredibly sturdy. Um, it is, you know, a little bit more technical. And I think an underrated pro of using a cold card um, is the fact that it is a little bit more uh, arduous to do certain tasks. Now, the, the feeling of accomplishment, though, when you do them, uh, you ultimately realize, like anything, to learn, you get your hands dirty. And as you do it, um, it becomes more uh, easier and easier over time. You might not think that you're uh, one to sign 
partially signed Bitcoin transactions using a micro SD card. But once you do it, you gain that confidence over time. And then all of a sudden it becomes like, you know, just an, another run of the mill thing that you do. So it is a nice way if you are inclined to, to dive more into the technicals of Bitcoin and understand how PSBT, so those partially signed Bitcoin transactions work. Um, it's kind of a cool thing to do to really dive in. But we do say that with full understanding that as a newcomer to the space, they might just be a little bit, you know, intimidating and I guess yeah, added steps that the Trezor and, and Ledger just take away. And Justine and David, please Perfect. feel free to, to jump in there with anything, any of your opinions as well, working with these devices. I think you answered it well. I think it's, I like to always tell people Bitcoin is a journey and it's okay to start with something easier and build up. So Trezor is a great device, super easy to use. Um, I would I would recommend that over, um, if I'm talking about ease of use, over a ledger, uh, personal preference. I think Cold Card is amazing. I love the team. It's a super uh, secure device that I, I use myself, but I do know the pain of newcomers trying to feel confident in that device. So I say confidence is important here. Um, and it's okay to take steps. That's what I would add in. Awesome. All right. So let's jump in. Um, just a couple of other questions here about cold card and specifically the devices themselves. So let's touch on Spencer's question here, which is a really great question. It's a hard one though. Uh, who owns Trezor, Ledger, cold card, et cetera? And how do we know we can trust their products? Where are they manufactured? So I'm just going to jump in here if you guys are okay with that. Uh, Spencer, this is a great question. I personally don't like trusting anything. That's why we Bitcoin, right? Um, so these, these manufacturers have been around for a long time. They're very much a trusted name in the space, but because we don't want to trust, we also know that that software is open source and you could actually verify it yourself. And the whole entire uh, Bitcoin community is constantly doing that. So that's something that you can find on their sites. Usually they do have their GitHub listed, um, but I do recommend not trusting those devices. And that's why multi-sig is great because it eliminates those single points of failure. And your key is the important part. The user interface that you use is important as well, but the key is the key, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so you can go on and actually verify that information yourself. So just wanted to kind of touch on that because I think it is a great question. Yeah, you know, we don't want to trust these, these companies. We want to verify for sure. All right, so John has a question about uh, Trezor's Shamir backup seed splitting. I don't know if David or Tyler, if one of you feels a little more strongly about it, what do we think about it? Um, what is it? Maybe a very quick overview of what that even is for those who are not aware and maybe describe what it's trying to solve and our thoughts on it when it comes to Unchained Capital Multisig. So I'm uh, definitely happy to take this one. Uh, I wrote a Twitter thread on it not too long ago. Um, my, if you read the Twitter thread, my uncle didn't actually ask me about the differences between multi-sig and Shamir secret sharing, um, but it was a fun way to start the thread. Um, so in talking about Shamir secret sharing, it's something that is shown uh, predominantly on the Trezor setup, right? You could create a standard seed backup or you could create you know, a, a Shamir secret share. Now, what you're doing there is instead of using three different seeds, uh, you are taking your existing seed and splitting it up into three parts. So the, the trade-offs associated when you're thinking about, you know, kind of pitting these two methods up uh, against one another, we need to start from the framework of, uh, it's actually additive, right? You could have one of your seeds as a part of your two or three that you apply a Shamir secret sharing to, but that goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about unneeded complexity, right? Uh, it's a common phrase, complexity can be the enemy of security and really making things too complex is a really easy way to shoot yourself in the foot. But looking at Shamir secret sharing kind of more specifically. So you're taking an existing seed and splitting it up into three parts. Uh, or three or more parts, an M of N, right? Just like, like in multi-sig with M of N, uh, such that any specific M brought together uh, would allow you to access the private key. So when we're thinking about the trade-offs associated there, well, one of the really awesome benefits of using multi-sig, and Justine uh, pointed this out earlier, you know, you don't have to have your devices co-located. In fact, you shouldn't in order to sign a transaction. Uh, with Shamir secret sharing, uh, it's kind of a one-time use sort of thing. You pull together your M of your N to, to access your private key, to access your seed words. And that's what you'd use to, to then go forward with your transaction. Um, you would also need then to set up a Shamir secret sharing after you spend if you wanted to maintain that level of security. So uh, along with kind of the 
technical prowess that you need in order to set up Shamir secret sharing and props to the Trezor team. They've, they've made that a uh, little bit easier with their slip 39 protocol. Um, but it is just a little bit more technical know-how involved and you do have to bring your, uh, secrets, right? Your Shamir secrets together to reveal your private key. So when we're thinking about kind of the, you know, more than just a one-time use, uh, multi-sig really shines in that area. And I do think it is a, a superior way of key distribution or a superior method rather. Uh, again, Justine, David, please feel free to jump in as well. That was perfect. That was perfect. <laughs> I was gonna say it is sort of a, uh, it's it's one of those things where it's a personal preference, just like we talked about passphrases earlier. I'm personally not a fan of passphrases with multi-sig, um, but then I can't tell you not to do it, right? So it's a personal preference thing. You gotta dig in, you gotta ask these questions, you gotta get the pros and cons and you make that decision for yourself. But I think that was, that was a great, great answer for sure. So we have a couple more minutes. So I'm gonna go through a couple more questions here from you guys, you have really great ones. Um, Jeff had a question about, uh, can a third key, like a cold card, be used as an additional backup to the two treasures in a vault? I'm going to clarify why I think you're asking here, Jeff. And if I'm incorrect, go ahead and yell at me in the text box. Um, but I think what you're asking is if you can use a cold card to also store one of the keys to back up the treasure, because on your vault, you can only have your two keys because it's a two of three multi sig. But device, remember, is just a user interface. So if you wanted to, import the seed phrases into a cold card and have that as a backup device it is something you could totally do on your own what you need to consider is now you have another piece of information you need to store securely right because if you have that backup device and it has your key on it you want to now secure that you don't want it in your drawer with your others because then what's the point of having it if the concern is just if the device breaks like the treasure breaks you can have a, a cold card or extra device at home that's not used yet just so you don't have to have that downtime of waiting for another device. And you can just import the seed phrase into it. And emergency situation here, let's say you have access to seed phrases, you can have one device, sign a transaction, wipe the device, import your other seed phrase into it, sign the transaction with it, and then set up your, uh, then, then fix things after the fact. I don't wanna make that too complex, but I think that's a way to really highlight that this is your key. This user interface, can be wiped and used for different keys. So I think that answers the question. Uh, it does, perfect, glad to hear. I was I was waiting for you to be yelling at me in the uh, chat, chat box, Jeff, uh, Jeff, so I'm glad that we got that. All right, perfect. So then we'll move on um, to the next question from Mark. Any advantage to having two different platforms, which I think he means devices, for example, Trezor and Cold Card for a two of three multi-sig, any downside? So I think what he's asking here, David, is are there any pros to having two different types of manufactured devices in your two of three multi-sig? So maybe you could talk about those pros, if any, and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I actually get asked that a lot. I think from my personal perspective, a lot like the Shamir splitting question, it is personal preference. Um, we do not see using two treasures or two cold cards, um, using two of the same as any store, sort of a, a security issue. Um, if you wanted to have two separate manufacturers um, generating keys, uh, that that would, that's obviously completely fine. But um, as a standard, we, we do ship two of the same devices because we don't see that as being any sort of a security um, issue. Now, I'm not sure if, I think that maybe um, some people might may disagree on that. I don't know if uh, Justine or Tyler, if you guys have a slightly different perspective on that, but um, typically it's not a concern uh, from from me uh, or or from Unchained. But maybe you guys could shed shed a little bit of color if you if you uh, had a different perspective. Yeah, I'll I'll just chime in and say um, kind of the underlying reason why I think folks might not want it like. Why they say, "Hey, you know, using two different manufacturers uh, might might help me from a security perspective." I think it's been discussed out in like whether that's Bitcoin Twitter or podcasts or reading materials about uh, this idea of like a retirement style attack where the same manufacturer is going to be generating your seeds and that they're not, you know, true random seeds. A uh, beautiful thing about about these hardware devices, uh, as Justine mentioned earlier, from an open source perspective, um, you know, if you were so technically inclined, uh, you could, you know, attempt to run validation on the random number generator. I'm not going to go too far into that because I don't know the exact specifics of that. But the open source point is really, really important. Um, in addition to that, 
everything we were talking about earlier with the wallet configuration file. Let's say somebody did have both of your of your seeds, right? And they did they did have both of those. Well, they still need all of the public keys in your quorum in order to access your addresses and spend your Bitcoin. They need that wallet configuration file. So it's not just as simple as, hey, I have both of your seeds. Now I can you know, move your Bitcoin. So there is still layers of access that are needed there. So it's just, you know, thinking about your security threat models, understanding that open source software is in play. I mean, I, I agree with David. I, I do feel, would feel confident um, with two Trezor devices uh, being, being used in, in my setup. Awesome. And it does look like, guys, we are at the top of the hour. Um, so I just noticed that we have still a few questions to go through. Um, but I think that if you did not get your questions answered here, go ahead and ping us one off. Um, it's just uh, our, our first names at unchained.com. Feel free to reach out for anything. But uh, we are going to wrap up. I don't know, uh, Justine or Tyler, do you have anything that you wanted to wrap up with and, and, uh, and, and share before I close this out? Just thanks for everybody for being here. We have these once a month. Uh, make sure you're checking your emails. I'm sure David will let you know a little bit about this. This is recorded. Um, we always get questions about these being recorded. They are always recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, next week. Thanks. Yeah, same, okay. same, same for me. It's uh, thank you for all the awesome questions. That's what makes it uh, exciting from our perspective, really engaged clients. And really it's everybody else on the call benefits from us answering other people's questions. So this is really, really awesome. I do appreciate everyone's time here today. Awesome. And yeah, to add to that, I think we need to do a two hour webinar where we do 30 minutes of a demo and then 90 minutes of just answering questions because we could we could have gone on for, for quite, a, quite a while here. So, all right, I'll close us out. Uh, just remember everybody, these are, um, to Justine's point, they're going to be uh, first Friday of every month, um, client exclusive webinars. So if you're an Unchained client, you'll get an email reminder to come join us um, for webinars, uh, Vault, um, Vault Basics, or Vault Continuing Education. And our next webinar is going to be on January 7th. So that's going to be same time, 11 o'clock AM uh, Central Time. And we're going to be covering operational security best practices. So that's probably the, probably the, the most questions we get during onboardings is where do I keep these devices? Where do I keep the seeds? So we'll be covering all of that in just about a month. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much for spending your time with us today and happy holidays. And I hope everyone has a great weekend.